And uh, here are the eight sectors that I think we should all be most concerned about, and the eight sectors that are most dangerous to Canada. First is uh, the investor state or Chapter 11 provisions. Who he heard of those provisions? Investor state, Chapter 11? Some of you. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, in Chapter 11 of NAFTA includes what they call the investor state <coughs> provisions. The investor state provisions actually allow companies to sue governments when governments make decisions in the public interest. So a government makes a decision, whether that's local or provincial or federal, and they say, this is in the public interest, this is our decision. The company can then say, not only, not, not because of the direct impact on their profits, but on possible impacts on their future profits, they can use these investor state provisions, the Chapter 11 of NAFTA, to sue our governments. Let me give you two examples. Ethel Corporation manufactured a neurotoxin, MMT, with serious dangerous health impacts. The Canadian government fortunately acted and banned that product, banned MMT. <coughs> and Ethel Corporation said, well, that's going to have a possible impact on our future potential profits. They sued Canadian taxpayers, everyone in this room. And Canada was obliged to cough up $15 million in compensation for a product that was known to be toxic and deadly. Absurd. But that's how investor state provisions work. Here's another example, more contemporary. Abitibi Bullwater, company in Newfoundland and Labrador. They took uh, extensive timber rights and water rights in Newfoundland and Labrador, signed a contract to guarantee jobs in return. It was a contractual agreement. Abitibi Bullwater said, we're not going to keep this contract. We're going to shut down these mills. The Newfoundland and Labrador government, with the unanimous support of the democratically elected legislature, all parties, liberal, conservative, NDP, voted to take back the timber rights and take back the water rights because they had reneged on the contract. Abitibi Bowater sued. And last summer, federal government took money out of everybody in this room, money out of their pockets, and paid $130 million in compensation to Abitibi Bowater for Abitibi Bowater refusing to keep their side of a contractual arrangement with the government. $130 million would take 20% of all the seniors in this country living in poverty and lift them out of poverty. That's a considerable amount of money. And the real kicker here is that the Chapter 11 provisions were set up to protect American companies in Canada. The idea being that foreign companies would be treated on an equal uh, footing with Canadian companies. But Abitibi Bowater is Canadian. So how did they use these Chapter 11 provisions? How did they use these investor state provisions? Well, they had a mailbox in Delaware, and they used that to attack our Canadian government. Now, the problem with CETA is it has investor state provisions on steroids, which means more companies will be able to use these provisions. And now, because of the Abitibi Bullwater precedent, it means it's not going to be European companies attacking our governments. It can be Canadian companies, it can be American companies, or South American companies. All you need to do is open a branch in Europe, or open a, put in a mailbox application, and all of a sudden you're European, and you can sue governments for decisions that they've taken in the best interests of the people of their jurisdiction. That is perhaps the most egregious, the most dangerous component of all in CETA the expanded investor state protections which allow companies to then use their own special courts. Now these companies actually have a role in choosing the judges as well. So they'll be using their own special courts to attack our governments. Now another risk within investor state is, as many of you know from the, from the past, in NAFTA, uh, bulk water exports under NAFTA are not considered a commodity until one province in this country decides to export bulk water. Now what we've had since NAFTA was signed is province after province after province tempted to allow those bulk water exports and once that faucet is turned on it can never be turned off. 
And I just wanted to pay tribute to Council of Canadians activists across the country. Because thus far, so far, every single time a province has tried to move towards bulk water exports, Council of Canadian activists have been there and they've pushed those provinces back and shut them down. So to date, we haven't had any bulk water exports and that's because of the Council of Canadians. So I pay hey. tribute to them. But that continues to be the risk that bulk water exports, that investor state provisions, that that decision so far to stop, uh, to not have exporting of our water could be overturned because the investor state provisions mean that companies will be asking for huge amounts of compensation. Second component at CETA is agriculture. The government has admitted publicly that the entire supply management sector is on the table. Has anybody heard of supply management here? <laughs> supply management, a few? Yep, okay, got a few folks that are up on, uh, on agriculture. Now this is a unique Canadian innovation, and what it does is guarantee stable prices to producers and supplies to the consumer. And other countries are looking at it just because it provides that kind of stability. In Canada, it provides its stability in the dairy industry, in the poultry industry, in the egg sectors. Now let's just compare for a moment what, what it means to have a supply managed sector compared to the kind of free-for-all free market in agriculture that the Conservatives love to talk about. Uh, Alberta, for example, more of a free market kind of place for agriculture, has the lowest farmer seats in the entire country. The agricultural sector in Alberta is worse off there than anywhere else. When you look at the so-called free market sectors, here's how they performed in 2010. The average, average cattle farm in Canada had a net operating income of minus $15,000, but they lost money. The average hog farm in Canada in 2010 had net operating income of minus $166,000. So those free market agricultural areas are not doing well. What's happened in supply management? In, uh, in egg and poultry, the average net farm receipts were $87,000 for the good in Canada. And for dairy farmers, it was $88,000 to the good, to the positive. What that means is supply management provides a real basis for rural agricultural communities. It provides an anchor stone, and you can see across the country, those where you have free market agriculture, those communities are dying. And the communities that depend on supply managed sector, those communities are thriving. Supply management, the cornerstone of Canadian agriculture, has been thrown on the table on CETA. Secondly, the Conservatives, as you know, have been trying for a number of years to do away with the Canadian Wheat Board, right? You've heard about that, right? Yeah. They've attacked the Wheat Board and they tried to rig the elections and a funny thing happened. You know, they were supposedly standing up for Canadian farmers and Canadian farmers now, year after year after year, have elected a solid majority of pro Canadian Wheat Board directors to the Canadian Wheat Board. Those are the farmers speaking across the country. They're saying they want the Wheat Board. So since the farmers want the Wheat Board, the Conservatives can't do away with it that way. What have they done? Throw it on the table on CETA. What they have done is they have put all the loan and initial payment guarantees that farmers depend on in the Wheat Board, put it on the table for negotiation. Yeah. Clever, huh? Mm -hmm. So what they're doing is destroying the Wheat Board by giving it away with, to the European Union. Thirdly, on food safety. Now, the agreement, as we have it now, would allow for no audit or inspection of food imported from the European Union. So you heard about these recent, uh, recent uh, outbreaks, such as tainted milk products from China going through the European Union. We would no longer have the right to actually inspect or audit that food <laughs> unless there are outbreaks and people are sick or die. Yes. Then Just we can move. move. <laughs> that is the agricultural components of what the Harper government has put on the table with CETA. There's one other e element of this that I'll come back to a little bit later on, and that's what they're doing with seeds. Uh, absolutely appalling. I'll come back to it in a moment. Third area, public services. 
Now we have the big European corporations and they've clearly targeted and they want access to Canadian public services such as our water, our utilities, our health care and our mail delivery. So let's look at what that could mean for Canada. Uh, the water companies particularly have been incredibly controversial in Europe. International uh, water companies that have operated abroad both in Europe and elsewhere have been involved in a number of controversies and scandals involving simple access to water. South Africa and Africa, South America and elsewhere. Now how many of you have heard of Cochabamba, Bolivia? Number of you, yeah. Here's just one example of how the European water companies actually, uh, actually operate. The company is called International Water Corporation. It took over the, uh, the water supply, the water utility in Cochabamba, Bolivia. And what they did next was jack up the prices so that uh, the cost to, of water in Cochabamba, having that access to water, was about a fifth of the average daily wage. Many uh, people in the community couldn't afford those rates. And the company signed a special contract with the city that actually prohibited the collection of rainwater. <laughs> so the company is refusing service to those who can't pay a fifth of their daily wage, and the company is saying, no, 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 that rainwater, that's ours. You can't collect it for your family. <laughs> Understandably, the people in Cochabamba, much as we saw with the Egyptians uh, over the last few weeks, revolted. A number of them died. There was peaceful demonstrations that were met with uh, with uh, violence by the state. But eventually, the uh, people of Cochabamba kicked out International Water Corporation and they restored public ownership to the utility in that area. This is the kind of treatment that we see from European water companies. And this is something that we have to be apprehensive about. Secondly, the private healthcare corporations are targeting Canadian Medicare. We know what happens when that happens. In the United States, they have private health care corporations, and the cost of their health care system, even though millions of Americans still are not covered, even, even under Obamacare, is twice as much per person than it is in Canada. They have a poorer system, but it costs twice as much. And the same health care corporations that have driven up costs in the United States and in some parts of Europe now want to come in and take over portions of our health care, our publicly funded public health care system. Now the problem is, as I mentioned earlier with Investor State, once those areas are privatized and the health care corporations move in, if government ever sees that the folly of privatizing our health care and tries to take it back, they are going to be subject to massive compensation claims that we, the people of this country, the taxpayers of this country are going to have to pay. Thirdly, when we talk about public services, the attack on our public postal services, and this has got to be a concern right across the country, particularly in rural areas of the country. Our universal public postal delivery service is based on the concept that the low-cost, high-density urban areas subsidize, in a sense, the high-cost, low-density rural areas. That's what it means to have universal postal services. If you start to cream that off and privatize the portions that are most interesting for profit-hungry corporations, what you end up with in rural areas is either gutting service or skyrocketing costs. And what does that mean for small businesses in those rural areas? And what does it mean for the individuals? Either scenario means that rural areas of our country will be hard hit by privatization of our public services and our postal service. Fourth section is public procurement. Now we all know the multiplier effect of taxpayers' dollars in the municipality, in the province. When we take taxpayers' dollars and we purchase something locally, that means that the dollars go further. And study after study after study have proven that when you purchase locally, you are making a much greater use of the taxpayer's dollar than you are even if you buy a cheaper good or a cheaper service from offshore. The European, big European corporations want to take on our public procurement. And so this is what the impacts will be 
for example, at the municipal level, the use of that fundamental principle of the use of the taxpayer's dollar locally to stimulate the local economy. The Columbia Institute released a study a few months ago that says this about the CETA procurement rules. Number one, CETA prohibits municipalities from using procurement as a local economic or social development tool by using local or Canadian goods, services, or labor. No longer possible to have local economic or social development through your municipal procurement. Number two, still from the Columbia Institute, CETA prohibits procurement for strategic purposes such as green technologies by using local or Canadian goods, services, or labor, and that would include such programs in Ontario as the Green Jobs Fund, which was designed to set up green technologies and stimulate the green technology sector in Ontario, prohibited by CETA. Number three, CETA prohibits procurement for sustainable development purposes such as promoting food security by adopting by local food practices. Now, this is particularly relevant in rural areas of the country. In the Okanagan, for example, where there is a healthy agricultural industry, you can no longer have the by local procurement policies that have allowed local agriculture, organic agriculture, to thrive. All prohibited by CETA. And that's why the Union of British Columbia Municipalities, their most recent meeting, said no to CETA and said they wanted a complete exemption for municipalities right across the country. Now, just on this note, I'd like to say uh, contacting your local municipal councillors, your school board trustees, this would be very helpful because this is something that municipal councillors and school board uh, commissioners are just starting to understand. Last night in Nelson, we had a standing room only crowd, and many of the people in the room were either with the regional district, the school board, or city council. They weren't aware of these provisions. So this is something that as activists we're going to have to get out there.